Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stan Katz. I'm a professor here at the Woodrow Wilson School, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. Uh, we're going to hear uh, uh, Elizabeth Holtzman speak about uh, the impeachment, uh, and I'm going to introduce her uh, very briefly. But before I do, I want to tell you uh, a story uh, about my connection to the impeachment clause of the Constitution, which I hope you've all read, because I hope you all have a copy of the, of the Constitution with you. Uh, I'm a legal historian, and uh, years ago, in the uh, early 1970s, I began a, a series at the Harvard University Press called Studies in Legal History, and one of the first books I commissioned, Judicial Impeachment, um, which is the most uh, common use of the impeachment clause. And uh, the person I engaged to write this book was a scholar uh, who had a long career as a practitioner uh, and had just retired, as it were, at the Harvard Law School. His name is Raoul Berger, a uh, very distinguished uh, legal historian, but a longtime practitioner, uh, but turned out to be a scholar scholar. Uh, he was at that time in his early 70s, and I was just starting off as a uh, professor. I think I was at the University of Chicago Law School at the, at the time. And uh, Raoul submitted his manuscript to me in the summer of uh, 1972. I was in New Hampshire at our place in New Hampshire. And, and I read it, and I saw that the last chapter of the book... Pardon? Two, not close enough? Okay, let's see if this is better. Sorry. At any rate, he sent me this manuscript, and it turned out that uh, he'd included a chapter on the impeachment of President Andrew Johnson. And I wrote, still can't hear? Okay. And I uh, told him that I couldn't print that because this was a book on judicial impeachment. And I said, uh, this is 1972, I said, it's clear there will never again be another presidential impeachment. <laughs> so he told me he was 72, he knew better, and he was right. Uh, uh, it is interesting, by the way, that uh, since that time, there's a quite distinguished scholar at Northern Illinois University, a man named David Kivig, who's now writing a book on the uh, ways in which impeachment has become part of the normal political process uh, in American history, and that's what we're going to hear about, I think, this afternoon. Um, Elizabeth Holtzman uh, graduated from Radcliffe College uh, and from the Harvard Law School. Uh, she was elected uh, to the uh, House of Representatives in uh, 1972, and she was, at the time, the youngest woman ever elected uh, to the United States Congress. She served there until 1981. Uh, she was on the, as some of you will remember, on the Judiciary Committee panel uh, during the uh, impeachment hearings for Richard Nixon. Uh, she was also on the House Budget Committee, and she was the chairwoman of the uh, House Immigration Subcommittee. Uh, in 1981, she was elected district attorney in Brooklyn, in Kings County, uh, a post she held until uh, 1985. And in 1985, uh, 89, she was elected the Comptroller of the City of New York. Uh, she is a distinguished uh, public servant. She is a distinguished writer and scholar, uh, and it's a great pleasure for us to have her here at the Woodrow Wilson School. Thank you very much, Professor. Can you all hear me? Am I too, too close to the mic, too far from the mic? Okay. Thank you. Perfect. I like that one. Okay. Um, I just want to say that uh, I'm very um, honored to be here. This is a very extraordinarily um, fine university. And uh, the issue of the impeachment of the president, while I don't agree that it should become common parlance in our political system, is one that requires reflection and um, consideration and is of great importance to this nation. 
I want to, before I begin, uh, thank the president of the university, Shirley Tillman, uh, and uh, thank her for helping uh, in connection with my being here today. And also, I want to thank um, Dale Satin, whose indefatigable efforts have made this afternoon possible. And I mean indefatigable. Okay. I also want to say something else. I'm here because there's a book called The Impeachment of George W. Bush, which um, I'll try in, 40, in 45 minutes to um, give you the argument of it, but I do suggest that for more nuance, you might want to read it. Um, but it does lay out the argument. And uh, I want to start first with how I came to this recognition and came to writing the book. And that was an early, early in the morning on a cold December day. And I picked up the New York Times as I walked out of the house. And uh, I saw a headline saying that the President of the United States had acknowledged that he had engaged in wiretapping without a court order. Um, the, the, the article didn't say that in the headline, but I know the statute. And so it was clear to me that he had defied a law of Congress. And I got this feeling in my stomach because I was part of the impeachment process against Richard Nixon. And one of the grounds of his impeachment that the House Judiciary Committee voted for on a bipartisan basis was wiretapping illegally. The president claimed that it was being done for national security purposes, and that it's President Nixon. And yet it was completely illegal. It was his staff, journalists. And uh, this was a ground for his impeachment. And I said, oh my god, here we go again. And so I um, began to uh, examine very closely, and from the point of view of my uh, niche expertise in the impeachment process, I had to read Mr. Berger's pretty hefty tome when it first came out. So. I learned a lot about what the impeachment clause was about, what it was intended to do, and why we have it. And I don't think you can start the analysis of impeachment today. You have to go back to what the framers intended in the Constitution. And in my book, I quote from the debates because they're very, very short, but they really tell us what we need to know. The framers, of course, as we all know, checks and balances, they were afraid of concentrated power. And when they examined the presidency and what they had done, they realized, you know, we have created all these checks. We have the Congress. We have the Supreme Court. We have the states. We have a federal system. Congress can override a veto. We have a four-year term of office. Isn't that enough to check a president? And they said no. They said, you know, in a four-year term, a president can do very dangerous things and wreak havoc with our nation. Well, what are we going to do about it, they said. They said, okay, we're going to have an impeachment clause. So they started with two terms, treason and bribery. Treason is defined in the Constitution. We all know what that means. Bribery is a very ancient concept, and we all know what that is. I mean, we might not know the exact details, but we understand the term. And then this delegate from Virginia got up and said, you know, treason and bribery, he said, there are great and dangerous offenses that a president can engage in that subvert the Constitution that are not covered by treason and bribery. And so he said, let's use the term high crimes and misdemeanors. So the constitutional provision on impeachment is treason, bribery and other high crimes and or other high crimes and misdemeanors and a high crime and misdemeanor is a great and dangerous offense that subverts the constitution that's what they were concerned about how to protect the constitution during the president's term of office well i think it's against that standard that we must judge president bush's conduct and I just want to look at a few elements of it. I mean, we could spend a long, long time discussing it, but I just want to go over the highlights. 
They're low lights too, but we'll just focus on the highlights. I want to start with the wiretapping, although that's because in a way that's very clear since we have an explicit precedent from the time of President Nixon and the House Judiciary Committee's vote on impeachment for that. <clears throat> um, I think the important thing to remember about the Foreign Intelligence Security Act is that it was enacted by Congress in direct response to the illegal wiretapping of Richard Nixon. Congress said, you know something, we cannot let this happen again. We do not want to see a president engaged in illegal wiretapping. So what are we going to do about it? We're going to pass a law. And by the way, you also had some other illegal wiretapping that was going on by federal agencies. So Congress said, we don't want to see illegal wiretapping. We don't want to see it from federal agencies. And we don't want to see it from a president. So how do we ensure that this kind of subversion of the Constitution doesn't happen again? Oh, they said, we're going to require a president to go to a special court. This is for foreign intelligence wiretapping. It's called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA. Well, this court that was set up, this, the law was passed in 1978 because they never wanted a president again on his own say-so to wiretap. You had to go before court. This is a specialized court. It has special expertise. And it's not a court, by the way, that is hard to get approval from. This court, since 1978, from the time that it started until President Bush started his special program, said yes to 19,000 wiretap requests from presidents. 19,000. Do you know how many times they said no? Five. That's not too hard. Not too hard. But President Bush said, uh-uh, starting in October 2001 and going until roughly January 2007, President Bush repeatedly and insistently and now publicly said, I don't have to obey the law. I just don't have to obey the law. Why don't I have to obey the law? I'm commander in chief. And anyway, if you don't like that argument, the law isn't nimble enough. I can't operate quickly enough. Well, of course, the law allows you to go in and wiretap and then get an order from the court afterwards, 72 hours later. That was not speedy enough for him. So he said, I don't have to obey the law. Well, you know, under the Constitution, there's another clause. I mean, the impeachment clause is a pretty important clause. But the president has certain, under Article II, the president has certain powers and certain responsibilities. And probably, aside from the oath of office, this key responsibility is, it's a very elegant phrase, to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. It's a very fancy way of saying he has to obey the law and he has to execute the law. Well, by refusing to obey the law, the president has violated the Constitution of the United States and his responsibility to obey the law and to execute the law, plain and simple. And there is no exception for commander in chief. And how do we know that? We know that not only because the Constitution doesn't create an exception for commander in chief, we know that because there's a Supreme Court case right on point. It happened during the Korean War and President Truman was faced with a strike by, at the steel mills. And President Truman said, oh my God, how am I going to get all the steel that I need for bullets and for guns and for planes and for ammo and tanks and all the rest? I'm going to seize these steel mills and I'm going to keep them running. And that case went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, and he said, you know, I'm commander in chief. I can seize the steel mills. Don't stop me. I'm commander in chief. And the Supreme Court said, uh-uh. You are commander in chief of the Army and the Navy. You are not commander in chief of the country. Those are really important words. And it's also important to understand who wrote those words. 
Those words were written by Justice Jackson. That opinion is now one of the most famous opinions that's ever been written by any Supreme Court justice in our entire history. And why is that such an important opinion? Not only because of the ruling, here we are in the middle of a war, here it is the President says, I'm Commander in Chief, stop me if you can, and they do. Jackson, we have to understand, was the Chief Prosecutor for the United States at the Nuremberg Trials. And what he saw at those trials is what informed this decision. And he talks about it. The tyranny that will happen if a president is not bound by the rule of law. And I just want to quote because it's um, such an important case. If I can find the page here, I just want to quote um, from it for you because <clears throat> the language is very important, not just, um, uh, okay. Um, <coughs> Okay. Give me a second here. Here he says, his command power, referring to the president, is subject to limitations consistent with a constitutional republic whose law and policy-making branch is a representative Congress. The purpose of lodging dual titles in one man, in other words, commander-in-chief and president, was to ensure that the civilian would control the military and not to enable the military to subordinate the presidential office. No penance would ever expiate the sin against free government of holding that a president can escape control of executive powers by law through assuming his military role. In other words, we could never expiate the sin against free government of allowing a president to say, I don't have to obey the law because I'm commander in chief. That's a 1954 case. I don't think it was on the president's reading list. I'm not sure of the Constitution. <laughs> I'm glad the president's into French literature, but maybe for next summer. Laura should think about Constitution, the steel seizure case. That'd be great reading for him. In any case, why is this important as a ground for impeachment it is a great and dangerous offense. By the way, it's a felony, federal felony, to violate the FISA law. We don't know how many people were wiretapped. We don't know who was heard. We don't know if it was journalists. We don't know if it was uh, uh, White House staffers, we don't know if it was political opponents, we don't know who was wiretapped. And if we allow this president to break a law of this magnitude and wiretap tens of thousands of Americans, maybe millions of Americans, we don't even know the scope of it, then what can the next president do? And where will we draw the line? So that is one of the central grounds for impeachment of the president, a great and dangerous offense. It subverts the Constitution. Um, the second, by the way, I should point out too that in January of this year, through his attorney general, the president announced that, you know, he could actually obey the law. Actually, he's going to drop all of this uh, non-court approved wiretapping, and he's going to get court approval now for all the wiretaps. Couldn't do it for five years six years, but now you're going five and a half years, it does raise a serious question about the bona fides of the claim that it couldn't be done before, that somehow it was impossible to obey the law before. So that's one ground for his impeachment. Another has to do with the lies and deceptions and exaggerations that were used by the President of the United States and his team to drive the country into the war in Iraq. Now, why is lying about a war a grave and dangerous offense that subverts the Constitution? Here again, let's go back to the Constitution <clears throat> and the framers and what they intended. Going to war is probably the gravest decision any country can make. As we know, it entails not just the loss of American lives, but the lives of those against whom we're fighting, and of course, the drain of huge amounts of money 
from our treasury. I mean, this war alone has already cost roughly a half a billion dollars, and the actual cost may amount to well over a trillion dollars, monies that certainly could be spent, as we know, on important domestic needs and other needs. 3,000, more than 3,000 Americans have already lost their lives. More than 20,000 have been wounded. There's now a very interesting question about the number of wounded people, because actually the number of people who use the medical facilities, so-called, of the United States government um, is, in, you know, is way in excess of the number of 22,000. Now, the decision, the framers did a very interesting thing about the war making powers. They gave the president one power. He's commander in chief of the Army and Navy. But they gave Congress a lot of powers. You can read, I have them all listed in, the, in my uh, book. I'll just give you a few of them. Congress has the power to provide for the common defense. Congress has the power to declare war. Power has, Congress has the power to raise and support armies. Congress has the power to make rules for the laws of war. And Congress has the power to write laws that are necessary and proper for the carrying out of all these other powers. Now, giving Congress all of these powers was a very deliberate act on the part of the framers. Not, it was not just on the theory that two heads are better than one when it comes to such a grave issue as the issue of war. You want both participation by the Congress and by the President, but it was more than that. As Madison explained in a letter to Jefferson, the purpose of giving Congress all these powers was not just abstract check and balances. It was because from their study of history, they knew that it was executives who wanted to take countries into unnecessary wars, and so they hoped that Congress would act as a break or as a check on going into war unnecessarily. And uh, there's a very important letter from Madison to Jefferson explaining that. So that's really what the framers anticipated. They knew that, you know, by the way, the framers weren't any wimps about war. They had just fought one. They won one against unbelievable odds against the British government. They understood that there were wars of necessity, but they understood that executives like to take countries into war, and they hoped that Congress would be a check. So if you stop and think about it, if a president lies to Congress and lies to the American people about the reasons for going to war, about the facts surrounding the need for war, then neither Congress nor the American people can play the role that was intended for them to play by the framers of the Constitution. They cannot act as a proper check on presidential powers because they don't understand what all the facts are. Now, I'm not getting into whether they should have looked more, they could have looked more, or, or they, they didn't look more. I'm not getting into that. I'm just saying that when you defraud the Congress, you create a subversion of the Constitution. And it is great and dangerous because thousands die. Trillions get spent. So I don't think there's any serious question that you have the grounds, in theory, for an impeachable offense if you have a president who drives the country into war on a basis of lies and deceptions. Well, what proof is there that the president lied? We know that the statements they gave us turned out to be false, every one of them. But difference between something that is false and something that is a lie. One case, you know that what you're saying is untrue. In the other case, you've just been duped. Well, let's put the dupe part aside for a moment and get to what did the president know and when did he know it? Very famous question. The president, and let's go to the arguments he made about the war. Clearly, we could know a whole lot more if Congress were to investigate, which it has not yet done and which it needs to do. But we do know enough to suggest that the president deliberately and knowingly lied and 
to, about the causes, the reasons for going to war. The first argument, I'm not, that's not necessarily in order, but one of the president gave two main arguments about why we had to go into war. I mean, they've now shifted, but at the time, what drove the country into war, what got, got Congress to give him the resolution authorizing the use of force, were two claims. Number one, that Saddam Hussein and Al Qaeda were in cahoots. And in fact, that suggestion was made so repeatedly that by the time we invaded Iraq, most Americans thought that Saddam Hussein was responsible for the World Trade Center bombings, uh, uh, airplanes that exploded. Um, and, uh, and so this, and, and the soldiers who were in Baghdad were, were quoted as saying, our being here is payback for 9-11 president was creating the impression that we had justification just as we had at Pearl Harbor. Saddam attacked us, or his ally, close ally attacked us, or his best friend attacked us, so we're retaliating for that. Well, how do we know the president knew that was false? Because we know he was personally told this. We don't know a lot of what he was told or a lot of what was in his briefing materials, and we don't know whether he even read what he was given. So. Putting that aside, this is a case where we, he was personally told and he heard. He processed. Right after 9-11, the president's in this big briefing room and they're all figuring out what to do and this is the meeting at which Rumsfeld said, oh, let's bomb Iraq because there are no good targets in Afghanistan, so let's bomb Iraq. A lot of good targets in Iraq. And um, after that meeting is over, the president approaches Richard Clark. Richard Clark is the chief of, was the chief of counterterrorism for the United States government. He was the most knowledgeable person about terrorism in the U.S. government. He had served several presidents. He was a professional. He was not a political person. The president said to him, personally, right to his face, was Saddam responsible for 9-11? And Clark's mouth, as he describes it, fell open and he said, you know, I can't believe the president's asking this question. I mean, how could he not know? And he said, no, Mr. President, Saddam Hussein is not responsible for 9-11. Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda are responsible for 9-11. President, I don't know how long it took him to process. He said, look into it again. Well, the fact is that Clark looked into it again, assembled a team of top counterterrorism officials of the U.S. government, and they sent a memo to the president repeating what Clark had said. And the memo came back with a note. It's not clear who wrote the note, saying, um, wrong answer, try again. Now, I'm not going to charge President Bush with the memo, because we don't know if he saw it, and we don't know if he agrees with the comment. But we know he was told. We know he was personally told to his face that there was no connection between Al-Qaeda, 9-11, and Saddam Hussein. So that's lie number one. Let's get to number two. This is a little bit more opaque, but still I want to raise it with you. And that has to do with something called the uranium in Niger, or Niger. I'm not a good, I don't know how to pronounce the name of the country. I've never been there. But, and that was has all been in the headlines because of Mr. Libby's conviction. But the president's other main claim about why we had to go to war was that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, and that was going to be a clear and present danger, and we couldn't wait. And the most important part of the weapons of mass destruction argument was nuclear weapons. He had only two grounds for the nuclear weapons, and one ground was this uranium in Niger. The point was, according to the president, that, and he said this in his State of the Union message in January 2003, just weeks before we went into war, this was part of the justification for going to war. He said the British government has found that 
Saddam has recent, recently tried to acquire nuclear, um, I'm sorry, uh, uranium in, in Africa. Actually referring to Niger. Okay. Now, he tried to make this claim in October. And George Tenet called up the White House and said, this was in the speech, and Tenet saw the speech and said, he can't say that. It can't be a fact witness, it's not true. In fact, this whole claim was based on a forgery. And the French government knew it was a forgery, and the CIA knew it was a forgery, and five out of six of the US intelligence agencies knew it was a forgery and knew it was totally hocus pocus nonsense. Now, it gets into his State of the Union message. Those 12 words or 16 words. The issue isn't how the words got in there, but what he knew about what he was saying. Now, he used the words British government, and that's the giveaway. Because he couldn't say US government. That would have been a blatant lie. For some reason, the British seem to, at the moment, have accepted this forgery. So he couldn't say U.S. government. And the question is, well, okay. He says British government. Let's assume he'd never been briefed on the Niger claim, which is a big assumption. Let's assume he never saw a memo, never read it, never heard. No, no equivalent of Richard Clark ever told him anything about it. To, to, to quote the British government suggests either two things. Either he knew that it was untrue, in which case it's a lie, or he failed to ask the obvious question. And what is the obvious question? What does the US government have to say about this? You're gonna go into a war based on, I mean, we love the British, we know that, but based on what they're gonna say, you never ask, well, what is the good US, US of A's intelligence have to say about this? Either you don't ask because you know the answer and you don't want to know the answer, or you don't ask because you have failed to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. You have failed your basic job as President of the United States and as Commander-in-Chief by failing to ask the obvious question. Britain says they did this. What does the U.S. intelligence say about that? And if you ask that question to Mr. Tennant, and he may well have, we don't know because we don't know all the briefings, he would have been told that the CIA believed that this document was a forgery, and not just the CIA, but the State Department, and this and that, and everything else, okay? So we have this, and this is not, the, the, the reason that this is an important argument is because it was the President of the United States, he himself used the words the British government. It wasn't his staff, it wasn't Cheney, it wasn't somebody else. I'm not ascribing any impeachable offenses to George Bush based on anything his staff did. I'm dealing with what he knew, what he said, and what he can be held responsible for. And the other interesting thing is that um, the president didn't seem to be too upset about these words having been said, because um, even after Mr. Hadley took responsibility for it, he got promoted. You would think that somebody who is your national deputy national security advisor and responsible for getting straight why we're going into a war. Wait a minute, it's not what's in the speech. Why are we going to war? We have two arguments, two arguments about nuclear weapons and you can get it straight. Of course, the other, we won't go into the other argument for a moment, but we could. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about that. But the fact of the matter is that the promotion of Stephen Hadley does suggest that the President of the United States ratified and endorsed what happened. And of course, that speech was key to winning public and congressional support for the war. I go briefly into two other arguments because I guess we have to um, leave some time for questions. But I want to go into the issue of torture because we have, again, 
an issue of the President's failure to obey the law or the rule of law and holding himself above it. The, um, I think we can all agree that Abu Ghraib um, was one of the most, well, putting aside the moral horror of it, um, was one of the most harmful uh, um, events uh, in the history of the U.S. Um, war effort in Iraq. And it was extremely counterproductive to us and was a great rallying cry for those who oppose us. How did Abu Ghraib happen? The President of the United States is responsible for taking care that the laws are faithfully executed. We have several laws and treaties that cover torture. There's the War Crimes Act of 1996 that carries out the Geneva Conventions and makes it a federal crime with the death penalty to violate the Geneva Conventions with regard to detainees. There's also the Anti-Torture Act, which also makes it a federal crime carrying the death penalty to engage in torture of detainees. Again, to carry out the uh, Convention Against Torture. In addition, we signed the Geneva Conventions. We ratified them. I want to say something about that because, you know, I, I want to talk about uh, how wimpy it is to support the Geneva Conventions, like the wimpy framers who wanted to put a check on presidential um, war-making powers. The Geneva Conventions were ratified in the wake of World War II in recognition of the horrors that were perpetrated on prisoners of war. We were victimized by the Japanese, of course, prisoners of war of other nations were also victimized. Nobody wanted to see a repetition of that ever again. The Geneva Conventions were ratified under the administration of President Dwight Eisenhower. He was an actual general. Didn't have to wear a jumpsuit <laughs> to prove anything. And President Eisenhower supported and endorsed the Geneva Conventions because he understood the consequences for the United States, not just for our soldiers, but for our stature in the world, who we were and what people would think of us. And you'll be very interested to know this, that the Geneva, when we started the Korean War, we had not yet ratified the Geneva Convention, so they weren't really um, binding on us. But that other great wimp, Douglas MacArthur, said, you know something? I'm going to put the Geneva Accords into effect voluntarily, and the United States will be bound to them even though we have not yet ratified the Geneva Conventions. This is what two top generals responsible for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of American soldiers felt about the Geneva Conventions as a result of World War II. These conventions were critical for our troops. They were critical for our country. They were critical not just in times of peace. They were critical in times of war. And now we get Mr. Bush. In February of 2002, who's given a memorandum that he's previously discussed, the memorandum recites, and he signs this memo, so he's responsible. I can't tell you that he read it, I can't tell you that he understood it, but he signed it and he put it into effect. And this memorandum withdrew Geneva Convention's protections from Al-Qaeda and from the Taliban. First time we've done anything like that. I don't, I don't know all the history of our adherence to uh, international humanitarian law, but this might be the first time that we have refused or uh, to obey or rejected uh, one of the international humanitarian treaties. Now, President 
So I thought this, I, I, I don't, can't understand why he did this, but anyway, he did this. We're in a new paradigm. In any case, um, the president, in my opinion, by removing those pr uh, protections, um, one, failed to take care that the laws were faithfully executed. The Geneva Conventions themselves have explicit terms for how you suspend them, and you can't suspend them during a conflict. Guess why? Very clear. That would be an easy gimmick. Um, that The suspension provisions weren't um, adopted. They were just interpreted so as to make them uh, basically inoperative. And the president had the responsibility to carry out the Geneva Conventions under the War Crimes Act. Um, not surprising, the uh, failures to adhere to the Geneva Conventions, both in, I mean, primarily in the war against, in, in Afghanistan, and then, which were carried over um, the, the failures into um, Guantanamo, migrated to Iraq. In Iraq, we said, oh, we are adhering to the Geneva Conventions, every dotted I and every cross T, we're going to adhere to them. Well, we had to because Iraqis were supposedly the people we cared about. So we were going to adhere to these conventions. So they all apply in full force. Well, what does that mean? What that means is that you have to adhere to the Geneva Conventions, but they weren't adhered to because Mr. Rumsfeld sent um, General Miller to Iraq to um, get more actionable intelligence. And after Mr. Miller left, they started using dogs. Uh, they also sent people from Afghanistan who had uh, U.S. Uh, officials who developed other techniques in Afghanistan of torture and uh, mistreatment of detainees. And of course, you had a migration of all of these techniques that violated the Geneva Conventions, that violated the War Crimes Act, that violated the Anti-Torture Act, and they wound up in Abu Ghraib. Well, the President set all of that in motion and is responsible for it. Under the Geneva Conventions, he is responsible, once he finds out about violations of the Geneva Conventions, for bringing those responsible to justice. Well, guess what happened? with regard to Abu Ghraib. He put none other than Secretary Rumsfeld in charge of the investigation. Oh, wait a minute. Mr. Rumsfeld himself admitted that he might have violated, he didn't admit that he violated it, but he admitted to actions that could constitute a violation of the Geneva Conventions, the War Crimes Act, the Anti-Torture Act, because he was responsible for ghosting at least one detainee. Well, how do you put someone in charge of an investigation who may be guilty. So he put Rumsfeld in charge. And beyond that, of course, Mr. Rumsfeld has no jurisdiction over the War Crimes Act or the Anti-Torture Act or violations of that. So he created an investigation that was going to be limited in its scope. And then Mr. Rumsfeld got the message because he further limited it by creating an appearance of activity, but the reality of no serious investigation. There were four or five or six or seven different separate investigations all being carried out at the same time, but none of those investigations had the responsibility for overall review of what happened and going up to the top. I'll give you an example. One investigation was of what the military intelligence unit did at Abu Ghraib, and another is what the police unit did. Who looked at what Rumsfeld did? And who looked at what Cheney did? And who looked at what President Bush did? And who looked at what Mr. Gonzalez did? And who looked at the torture memos that were written? Nobody. Nobody. Still to this day. Failure to, t to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. The President of the United States has failed to carry out the responsibilities to bring to justice those who violated the Geneva Conventions with regard to Iraq. And failed to execute the laws with regard to the War Crimes Act. Finally, I'll just mention Katrina, um, because this is kind of a different category, but it's also, it seems to me, another important way in which the President failed to take care that the laws were faithfully executed and is guilty of an impeachable offense. 
The um, president was personally warned about Katrina. He sat in a room, I think it was in Texas, and there was a video conference. And uh, there were two people on this video conference, at least, with the president. One was, you've done a heck of a job, Brownie. He's the head of FEMA, the Federal Disaster Agency. And the other was the head of the National Hurricane Disaster, uh, National Hurricane uh, Center. And these two people said to him, at first, of course, the president denied this, but then the videotape turned up. The president said, was told by Brownie that New Orleans was facing a catastrophe. He used his word, catastrophe. Uh, the direct hurricane director said the levees could be breached. Okay, so the president understands that there could be a catastrophe. We're talking about a city, if the levees breach, where lives of tens of thousands of people could be at stake. We're talking about destruction of property, possibly in the billions. We're talking about the you know damage to one of the great cities, not just of America, but of the world. The other thing you have to know is that the unique structure of the laws, and this I'm basing my remarks on a study that was done by a Republican committee in Congress, because the Democrats wouldn't join it, so it was a Republican select committee that looked at Katrina. And they said, under the structure of laws dealing with disasters, the president is the commander in chief of disaster relief. And he is the only one in the administration who can mobilize all the forces, including the military, civilian forces, medical help, and the like. So you have this linkage. The president under the structure of laws is the only one who can mobilize everything. And the president is personally told there's going to be a catastrophe. So what does he do? The, the Constitution says the president has to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. We're not talking about some little accident on the corner of um, 42nd Street and Times Square. We're talking about a major catastrophe. President, do you think he asks one question? Like, has the federal government done everything it can? Is there something else I can do? Is there something else? The military can do? Have we mobilized all the federal resources? Nope. All he says is, let's pray for the people of New Orleans. And then he goes back on vacation. I do not think that this is what the framers had in mind when they talked about take care that the laws are faithfully executed. And the consequences, of course, were of tremendous dis of terrific disaster, some of which undoubtedly could have been alleviated had the federal government acted in time. Troops didn't show up for five days, or four days, a long period of time to help out. So I think we have a president who has violated the Constitution. The laws of this country has engaged in great and dangerous offenses that subvert the Constitution has failed to take care that the laws are faithfully executed, all to the great damage of our great republic, of our constitution, and of our lib liberties. So the question is, what happens? The framers of the Constitution did not put the impeachment clause in the Supreme Court. They didn't put it off in some little obscure place. They gave it to the Congress of the United States. And why'd they do that? Because ultimately, they gave it to the American people. Congress is responsive to the American people. And so it's up to us. We have the power, we have the ability, and if we don't act to protect the Constitution, what will happen to the future? What will happen to us now? We have a president who people say, oh my goodness, why bother? You know, he's gonna be out of office by January 2008, I'm sorry, yeah, January 2009, just stop and think of what 
can happen between now and then. You think that everything was benign, nothing can happen. We could have, God only knows what could happen in Iraq. And what about the possible invasion of Iran? Could we go into another war based on lies and deception and deceit? How many other laws will be violated by this president? We haven't gone into the signing statements. And Walter Reed Hospital is another example of Katrina and this president's inability to take care that the laws are faithfully executed with respect to the people of the United States. So it's up to us. We can call on Congress to do the investigations that are necessary. We can get state legislatures to act to call on Congress. But if we are silent, what will they say about us? Did we do everything we can to keep this democracy a democracy? Thank you very much. questions now, and I'm going to allow uh, Congresswoman Holzman to do that herself, but we usually ask if there's a student who has a question first, and I think I see one. Can we ask you to you know, speak into a mic and identify yourself, please? Uh, Francisco Nava, I'm a sophomore here at Princeton. Um, I think if I were to name Abraham Lincoln as someone we all, as a president who we respect, um, who faithfully upheld the Constitution to the best of his abilities, given that he was... I, I, I can't really hear what you're saying, so okay. you have to speak Son. clearly into the mic if you don't mind. It's on. It's on. It's on. No, 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 speak into the mic. All right, there we go. If I were to give you the example of Abraham Lincoln as a president who faithfully upheld the Constitution the best he could, given the status of the Union, and given that he was a wartime president, the record would show, if somebody like you could speak about uh, his, his, his record as president, would show that he violated the Constitution by uh, not, not upholding habeas corpus, withholding it from captured soldiers. Uh, and also in his second inaugural, speaking about the authority of the Supreme Court with respect to Dred Scott, he said that he wasn't sh he had questions ultimately about the finality, who is the ultimate interpreter of the Constitution, whether it is a Supreme Court or not. All right, so my question is, why is it that we can not look at this at the same way at Lincoln through your lens and wonder if he should be, have been uh, impeached for, for some of the crimes, if that we want to call them that, uh, they committed? Well, uh, I'm not an expert on Lincoln and uh, the and habeas corpus, but his actions with regard to that have been criticized. I do believe, however, I could maybe there are historians in this room, that ultimately Congress uh, acted with respect to that. Um, but w you could cite more recent examples. You could cite President Johnson, who lied with regard to the war in Vietnam, and nothing happened. But, you know, I was a prosecutor, and the argument that other people did bad things and weren't prosecuted, so why are you going after me? I mean, look at all those murderers who got away with it. Don't cut me. I mean, it's not an argument that holds much appeal. And particularly, particularly, let's put, him, put Lincoln aside, we've now had, since Vietnam, which is 65, so we're talking about, you know, 32 years. In the last 32 years, we've had now lies about war by Johnson, Nixon with regard to the secret bombing of Cambodia. Mm, I don't know if you want to talk about the Iran Contra, let's leave that out. But this, 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 the war in Iraq, when is this going to stop? What is the price that we are paying for this? And so it seems to me at some point the American people have to say, okay, you want to be president of the United States? Level with us. Respect us enough to tell us the truth. You want to go to war in Iraq? What are the reasons? If you give us the reasons, we'll listen. We'll respect you. We'll even give you the benefit of the doubt. But don't lie to us. Don't tell us what's not true. Believe in democracy. Trust the people to make those kinds of decisions. But for some reason, the presidents don't want to do this. And 
This is eating out, and the consequences for our democracy itself, because it's because of the war. The president now claims I'm commander in chief, so I don't have to obey the Constitution on FISA. I don't have to obey the law on FISA. I don't have to. I can engage in torture. I can do this and that. So the consequences of the democratic process. It's not just habeas corpus. One, um, one action of the president. This is something that's attacking the very fiber and the quality of our democracy. And so I think, I think we need to stop it. And I think if this president is, isn't held to account, we're just on down a very long and very discouraging road, ultimately, to some kind of tyranny. And I don't want to be there. That's not the America that I love. That's not the kind of country I want to have. Yes. Oh, well, yeah, but you see, I didn't have time to include him in this speech. <laughs> That's another whole speech. Um, I, I think if anybody looks very, if, if the investigations, I mean, I mentioned certain areas. I do think additional investigation needs to be done. I think any serious investigation will uncover the role that President Cheney played, um, which was, he also was a mouthpiece of misstatement after misstatement about the war, and um, we don't know the full role that he played with regard to the Libby scandal and the Libby conviction and so forth. Uh, but I, I do believe that um, a full investigation of Mr. Cheney will result in what I call actually a trifecta, which is the removal of Mr. Bush, the removal of Mr. Cheney, and the accession of the first woman as President of the United States. <laughs> Yes. My name is Marilyn Mix. Uh, I heard yesterday that Chuck Hagel mentioned the I word, the impeachment word, but the Democrats are staying away from it as if it were the plague. I heard Jim Moran today say it's not on the table. Why? Well, I think uh, I don't really understand the reason for it. I think that. Um, I think when Nancy Pelosi was asked about it, she had a real reason for saying that, because if she became the advocate, it would seem as though she were trying to become president, and that, that's not what we're talking about here. This is the impeachment cannot be seen by the American people as a political act, as it was in the Clinton impeachment. It has to be seen as a way of preserving democracy against a president who abuses his, the power of his office and thinks puts himself above the rule of law. But. The arguments that I've heard are really not very persuasive to me. Um, one argument is, well, we have a very important policy agenda that we have to carry out. But that kind of, um, in my opinion, insults the intelligence of the American people. Because no policies can be carried out if you don't, except in the framework of a robust democracy. And if that democracy erodes, what's the quality of, our, of those policies? I mean, one good example is now what's going to happen with the trillion dollars less available for all the social programs that Democrats really care about? And what's going to happen if we go to another war in Iran? And where's, you know, and, and, and what about the lives of the soldiers, both who die and those who come back, that are shattered? Um, so I, I, I think that that argument misconceives it. The American people understand that the most precious thing is the Constitution and the rule of law. We discovered that during the impeachment of Richard Nixon. But Congress, let me go back and say this also as an answer to you. Don't be surprised that the Congress is reluctant. Congress was reluctant in the Nixon impeachment. You have to go back to that and remember it. It was not Congress that started the impeachment process against Richard Nixon. It was the American people. When Richard Nixon fired the special prosecutor, the American people rose up in anger and said, enough is enough. Congress, you have to hold the president accountable. But till that time, no impeachment talk. You had Dean saying, I told the president that there was a cancer on the presidency, that um, bribes were being given paid to the hush money and bribes were being paid to the burglars, that presidential pardons were being offered. 
And the president said, I know where you can get money. You know, that had come out. Was there talk of impeachment for that? Absolutely not. Uh, Haldeman and Ehrlichman had resigned. You had all the stuff coming out about Watergate and Mitchell and all the rest. There was no talk of impeachment over that. It was the American people who forced it. That's the difference between the failed impeachment of Clinton and also of the Johnson impeachment, which was totally partisan, decided in back rooms, smoke-filled back rooms in the Capitol. Oh, we're going to get rid of a president. That will not work. The American people won't stand for it for one second, and they shouldn't. But when the American people say, we want our democracy, and we want our Constitution, and we want our rule of law, and Congress, you have to act to do it, then they will do it. Jim Moran may say one thing, and Nancy Pelosi may say one thing, but if their constituents say, we want this, they will act. In Vermont, just two days ago, on the 6th of March, about 30 town meetings, can't have a more democratic process than the town meetings in Vermont, 30 town meetings voted for the impeachment of George W. Bush and called on the state legislature to forward a resolution calling for his impeachment to the Congress. There are actions going on in other legislatures around the country, the state of New Mexico, the state of Washington. It can happen here in New Jersey. I guarantee you, if members of Congress heard from their constituents on this subject, not from the press, what do you think? They heard from their constituents on this subject, there'd be a very different response. If the American people want to preserve their democracy, then the Congress will act, just as they did during the Nixon impeachment. And we have to go back to Watergate to understand that history. California, Illinois, Minnesota, New Mexico, Washington, and Vermont have introduced resolutions to impeach. Now, in this state of New Jersey, there are three organizations that have come together, North, Central, and South New Jersey, to persuade our legislature to introduce a resolution to impeach President Bush and Vice President Cheney. My question, Congresswoman Holtzman, is, would you actively support an effort in New Jersey to pass through the legislature a resolution to impeach, which will then exert pressure on the Congress to initiate impeachment proceedings? Well, I'd be very happy to talk about um, what I believe are the grounds of impeachment. I was actually asked by the legislature in New Mexico to testify isn't exactly the right word, but to provide testimony via um, video teleconference, which was then played before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I believe that they um, adopted the resolution, the committee, and it's now going to the floor of the Senate in New Mexico. So I am perfectly happy to assist uh, any legislature or any groups that are trying to get the legislature to understand what the issues are, what the facts are, what the Constitution says. but. It's, I, I'm just an accessory. <laughs> uh, I think that this, the effort has to come from the people of this state or from the uh, people of various states, as it has in Vermont. People have to organize themselves. And uh, if, if I can be of assistance in, in uh, educating the legislatures on this process and on what the Constitution holds, then I'm happy to do that. But I can't think of anything more important. People talk about how we're going to stop the war in Iraq and I don't believe that the con even if the Congress passed resolutions or passed bills cutting off the war, um, uh, money for the war, which I doubt that they will do, the President could veto it. I was there when we tried to stop the bombing of Cambodia, and the President vetoed the first legislation that we proposed cutting off uh, funds for that. So this is not an easy process to stop a war, and I don't think this President wants in any way, shape, or form to do that. So I think um, impeachment is a critical tool to preserve our democracy and our future. The student over there. Oh, good. Oh, good. Thank you. 
40 pounds in the mouth. Okay, okay, great. I have a quick question about Katrina and, and, and uh, torture. It, uh, it seems to me the first few issues or something, why it happened in Iraq, he was getting 12 days in prison. If he should, but Katrina and, and the torture, these seem to be cases of incompetence and yes, this is oversight. I was wondering what kind of legal basis it is for incompetence. Well, you ask a very good question, and, uh, oh, question was, the, the uh, gentleman said that um, the arguments for Katrina and for torture seemed to me more uh, issues of oversight or incompetence, the failure to act as opposed to improper actions. Is that a fair summary? Okay. Um, I didn't say this in Katrina, and in, in all fairness, I should say it with regard to the Katrina argument. The framers of the Constitution said that maladministration, they actually tried to put that word in before they put in the word high crimes and misdemeanors, and they decided that maladministration was not a ground for impeachment. And clearly couldn't be a ground. I mean, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Every president is going to make some mistakes, without any doubt. But if you take Katrina, I'll talk about the torture in a second. If you take Katrina, there's a level of mistake and there's a level of mistake. You know, the budget office adds up the numbers incorrectly. People don't get paid Social Security checks. That's also not even the president's personal actions. It's his administration. What you have here is the president was personally told about the problem. Okay, so let's take that as a start. The president is personally told. He's the president. Under the law, he alone is given the power to mobilize the government. There's no one else who could do it. He can't say, Frank, you go take care of this, or John, or Amy, leave me out of it. You do your job. He's the one. Can't pass that over to anybody. So he's the one under the structure of laws. At some point, the failure to act and this seems to me a case when we're not talking about one life or 10 lives or even 100 lives or 1,000 lives. You're talking about tens of thousands of lives were at risk and billions, tens of billions of dollars of property. For the president to walk away when he's told not to give one order, not to give one instruction, not to ask one question, what does it mean to take care that the laws are faithfully executed? You know, at some point, and maybe it is kind of incompetence, maybe he doesn't understand what it means to be president of the United States. Well, if he can't act in circumstances like that, then maybe he shouldn't be president at all. Because there will be other circumstances. It'll be it's not Katrina, it's something else. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a very good question. Where does mismanagement or maladministration cross over into an impeachable offense. And people could argue about where that line is, and people could argue with me that this is, doesn't amount to impeachable offense. I want to disagree with you about torture because of two reasons. Number one, this is not inaction, first of all. The president himself set in motion by signing a memorandum, set in motion the withdrawal of Geneva protections, and thus set in motion the whole process by which mistreatment of detainees took place. Secondly, he is responsible for enforcing the law with regard to um, punishment. He knows that under the Geneva Conventions, and he just failed to do that under the Geneva Conventions. And he's also responsible for enforcing the law, the War Crimes Act law. So I, I think it's not incompetence. I think that the, this was a policy decision of his to allow torture and mistreatment to take place. And, and not punishing it is part and parcel of carrying that through. So I don't see that. It's partly in action, but he set it in motion. Yes, ma'am. At, at least with regard to the torture um, part of that, there, um, you know, Vice um, Secretary of Defense. Rumsfeld actually wrote a memo and he changed coming up with the alternative techniques for interrogation that included torture. And even after they passed the Detainee Treatment Act stating you can't torture with McCain and the three senators talking about it, 
Gordon England in an administration memo said we didn't say we couldn't order board. That was one of the. I, I'm having a hard time hearing you. You just either speaking too fast or there's an echo or whatever. You just slow down and make your point. With, re with regard to the points on torture in the administration, it was Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld who uh, set in place um, an alternative interrogation procedure right. that allowed torture. There were memos from administration um, people, Gordon England, saying you could waterboard even after the Detainee Treatment Act, in theory, forbade it. But I think the greatest problem with impeachment is going to be Congress itself, given they passed, you know, with the Geneva Conventions, they passed the Military Commissions Act. I know many of them are still sitting in Congress, which basically took away the Geneva Conventions. It pays lip service, says they're to be used as a source of rights. It gives retroactive immunity for those who violated it and um, lets the president define the grave breaches, really emasculates the conventions altogether. Well, I mean, uh that Congress uh, went along with various things. I think that that I think there may be a problem in terms of getting Congress to agree to impeach because some of them may say, "Well, I wasn't um, uh, you know, that somehow we were complicit, or the members of Congress were complicit, or they knew, or whatever." But I, to me, that is not the issue. The issue is not that you had accessories after the fact, as in you're doing crime you have a president who set this in motion. So um, I think that the real, uh, I, I mean, there are many things that Secretary Rumsfeld did which made his appointment as um, enforcer of the Geneva Conventions and uh, the person who was supposed to uh, find out all the people who were responsible absurd, um, But uh, which I didn't go into. I'm glad you pointed that out. But I, I think the biggest inhibition is that the American people seem not to have spoken out on this subject. And what I want to try to get at least this audience to understand is one, there is time to act, and two, it's necessary to act, and three, the American people are really open to this. I want to mention, uh, I didn't before, that there was a poll taken by, mm, I wasn't going to, maybe, I don't know about that poll, but I know about a Newsweek poll that was done in October which showed that mm, about 51% of the American people thought that impeachment should be some sort of priority, either high or low, and that impeachment was opposed by, mm, I'm trying to remember the number now, uh, somewhere in the low 40s. Now, if you compare those numbers to the poll numbers about Clinton, those who were in favor of Clinton's impeachment, on average, was about, 23, 24 percent versus over 50 percent, and those opposed in the mid 60s as opposed to in the low 40s. So that gives you a sense that the American people have a, have a clue that this president has gravely abused the laws and are open to impeachment. So we've got to get American people mobilized, and we've got to get the Congress to act. And I think those things can still happen, but. The press has to also play a role, and I don't see any major newspapers reporting the vote in Vermont, which is a critical thing. Oh, before we lose the audience, the people in this room want to know that, that there is part and parcel of people in this area that are moving towards impeachment. We have an, a group called Central Jersey Impeach Group, which came out of the impeachment task force of the Princeton Community Democratic Organization. Some of you on your way in were asked to sign our petitions. We've had petitions out on and off over the last uh, year. And right now, we're working with our own assemblyman, Reed Gashora, who has drafted a resolution for the New Jersey legislature. He's also drafted the anti-war resolution, and he's working very actively to get that passed today. And Shirley Turner, for, uh, to, to pass the anti-war resolution uh, this next week. So if we can push our state legislature to get that anti-war resolution passed, then we can, can work with Reed Gashora to have a resolution in the state of New Jersey. And I, and I hope that you can uh, come to us. Linda Gotchfeld is the co-chair along with myself, Mary Ellen Marino of the Central Impeach Group. We have petitions. 
We're, we're inviting people to go on the march to the Pentagon. We're going to have meetings here, to, like a teach-in if we can. And uh, we need to arouse the people because, as you said, we have time to act. People are very concerned about... Okay, I want to let, give some people a chance to ask questions. That wasn't exactly They're a question. They're concerned about how we okay. do it. Um, who has it? Let me just get someone in the back of the room. Okay. Very quick, just uh, your thoughts on signing statements and your president views and how that fits in or well, well, of course, the, the signing statements, the president um, issued a signing statement on the torture issue. Let me just, as the gentleman asked about, the president signed uh, McCain's bill, um, which um, barred torture. And then he said, well, uh, in a signing statement, I'm not really bound to, to obey this. problem with the signing statements is that um, here the president is basically taking the position that even though he signs a bill into law, he's not necessarily bound to obey it. As commander-in-chief, he's above the law, which we know is, you know, there's no permission for him to disobey the law. And the problem that signing statements uh, create is that it's impossible for Congress actually to determine whether the president has obeyed the law or not, because he's issued something like 720 signing statements, and you'd have to examine every one of those laws and every one of his actions to determine whether he violated the law or not. It's not possible. This system works on the basic premise that the president will obey the law and that as president he will execute the law. We can't have a system in which a president can say, I'm above the law, catch me if you can, ha ha. This is, this is tyranny. And that's not the constitu that's not the country that the framers set up. Uh, yes, sir. How many members of, how many members of Congress are needed to bring the articles of impeachment. A majority, one member to introduce the articles. But I think what you need before the articles of impeachment, you need to have an investigation of several things. And it doesn't have to be done by the House. Oh, let me just step back. The process is the House of Representatives votes by majority for impeachment, articles of impeachment, and the Senate must convict by two-thirds majority with the Supreme Court um, Chief Justice sitting at trial. But during Watergate, which was, again, the only presidential impeachment that ever withstood historical scrutiny, during Watergate, the actual investigations of presidential misconduct were not conducted by the impeachment committee, the House Judiciary Committee. They were conducted by a select committee of the Senate. Sam Irvin and Howard Baker were the two leaders of that. And they were conducted by the grand jury. So the investigation, for example, what was Cheney's role? What did the president say? and do with regard to Libby? What did the Cheney say and do? What did they tell the prosecutor? Those kinds of things. What did the president know and when did he know it about the war in Iraq? So what were all the rest of the lies that he told us? That Congress has to investigate and very easy for them to do that. And it doesn't have to be the House, doesn't, it could be the Senate, it could be a select committee, it could be any kind of committee. But they can get the answers to those questions, and they need to get the answers to the questions. They need to go into the FISA, uh, violation of the FISA rule, and find out who was wiretapped and why. I mean, on the face of it, you have an impeachable offense. But it would also be nice to understand what the ramifications were of this for basic constitutional rights of Americans. Uh, so I think there is some investigation that needs to be done by Congress, and that's what really should happen. Uh, and then, and, but any time any member wants to, he or she can introduce a resolution for impeachment. But uh, I, I'm not sure that we're ready for that resolution. I think we need to have the investigations that I just mentioned first. One more question. Okay. Yes, yes you. Uh, I, I don't think you've commented on how the states, such as Vermont and New Mexico and uh, Washington, can it, can cause the question to come to the floor. Would you please okay. address that? That's a good point. There, the Some of the states have said, well, you know, why us? What do we have to do with this? Well, what they have to do with it is that they are part and parcel of our democratic system in this country, and so state legislatures can have their voices heard. And actually, the um, rules of the House of Representatives contemplate that states would play a role in this process because there's something called Jefferson's Manual, which is even more obscure than Mr. Rauberger's book on the impeachment of presidents. 
Jefferson's manual, written by Thomas Jefferson, naturally, has uh, the rules of the House of Representatives. And in those rules, which are very antique, go back to the beginning of the House, it contemplates that state legislatures could send resolutions on impeachment to the Congress. Now, that doesn't automatically trigger anything. But it's just like the American people in water and the Saturday Night Massacre saying, Congress, you better act. When the state legislatures send resolutions, Congress is going to pay attention. The American people will pay attention. It is another way of forcing Congress to confront what's happened to our Constitution and to take action. So you can't force anything, but it's another way of saying to the U.S. Congress, you cannot put your head in the sand anymore. This is a president who has shredded, continues to shred the Constitution, and we all Americans, whether we're in the state legislature, whether we're in a city council, whether a county council, county legislature, are just a plain old American citizen, we all have a responsibility to protect and preserve our Constitution. So that's where it comes into play. Thank you very much. Thank you.